Bible from Pastor Pam about where our natural habitat is and that our natural habitat is with God. And, and that's where we belong. That's where we were created to be in relationship and in communion with Him. And the devil's, the devil's objective is to try to lure us out like somebody trying to catch a fish, take it out of its natural habitat. And what happens when a fish gets out of water? It starts flopping around everywhere and it just, it's embarrassing. <laughs> and the longer that fish stays uh, in the atmosphere and in the habitat that it is not supposed to be in, the sooner it will die. The sooner it will die. And so uh, we want to remain uh, where God is. Amen? Amen. And so this morning, we are going to talk about the devil's plan and what he tries to do to lure us out and to allure us and to tempt us out of our natural habitat and how if we know what it looks like ahead of time, we'll be able to resist him. Anybody ever watch the old uh, show Batman? I'm talking wham, pow, womp, Batman, right? And I love that show. Uh, I wasn't watching the original, but I watched the reruns when I was a child, and it's still on TV. And it's so, so cheesy good. It's so good. Right? When they're walking up the road, up the building and stuff like that. It's such a good show. It's such a good show. Very typical in Batman is uh, the villain, whether the Joker or the Penguin or the Riddler, would have Batman and Robin tied up somewhere, right? Tied up in their lair. If you're a villain, you have to have a lair, right? And, and they, they'd be tied up. And for whatever reason, villains always got stuff they got to do. So here, brothers, why don't you be Batman and Robin for us this morning, all right? Let's, Greg and Maurice came all the way, staying in the front here, came all the way from New York and New Jersey. Are you from New Jersey? Uh, Long Island. Long Island, all right. Is that in Rhode Island? That's what everybody says to us. They say we're from Rhode Island. They're like, oh, Long Island? So I got to do it to you. Hallelujah. All right. So here we got Batman and Robin. Right. They're tied up in the Joker's lair, right? And right before the Joker finishes them off, right? The Joker and the Riddler, they always leave it for his henchmen, right? The goons. And so what does the Joker do right before they're about to be finished off? He says, let me tell you, now that I've got you, Cape Crusaders... My master plan of how I'm going to take over the city and how I have all of the money stored in the top of the building and the access code to get into the room is one, two, three, four. <laughs> now since I've defeated you, I'm off to finish the plan. Don't villains always do that? <laughs> and so the Joker, or the Penguin, or the Riddler, or Catwoman, they leave, and then what happens, right? Batman finds something out of his utility belt, gets loose, Freeze Robin, right? Freeze himself, and then they're on their way. Let's hear it for Batman and Robin. Excellent. <laughs> but what's the problem for the villain? He told them exactly what his plan was and exactly what he was going to do. And so every single episode of Batman, every single episode, Batman and Robin were able to defeat the villains, oftentimes because the villain told them his plan before he, he, he actually finished them off, right? And sometimes you had to wait for next week, the same bat time, the same bat channel. But they always figured it out. They always figured it out. And I was thinking about that because, you know, in many ways, our villain, our arch enemy, Satan, the devil, the serpent, he's so dumb. And, and though he tries to trap us and entangle us, he's our, we, we already know what his plans are. We already know what his plots are and his schemes are and his devices are. We, we see in Scripture him foil himself so that as soon as we break free from what he has bound us in, we're able to go and defeat him and have victory. And he's just, just like the Joker, just like Batman, just not like Batman, just like the Penguin and all the rest, but we're Batman. Look at your neighbor and say, I am Batman. <laughs> All right, y'all having too much fun with that. Turn to Genesis chapter 3. <laughs> Never thought you'd say that. And so uh, this morning, we're going to talk about the devil's plan. All right? We're going to talk about four things that the devil has planned so that we know when these things start to uh, reveal themselves in our lives or in our world 
that it's the devil and that we can overcome and defeat him. All right. So we're going to I'm going to do a little bit of some teaching this morning, but I want you to uh, hear these scriptures, hear these words so that you can walk out armed to have victory over what our arch nemesis has planned for you and for the world. You know, Jesus was able to recognize when the devil was working and he would always call him out on the spot. So we want to examine what are the signs of the devil at work so we can call him out as well. So when these four things exist, where uh, now we know, well, we will know where they're coming from, okay? Where these things are coming from. Here are the four things. The devil's plans are to lie, to accuse, to enslave, and to oppose the gospel. There are others, but those are the four for this morning. The devil's plans, you're tied up, he's about to go and do something dirty, and he says, look, my plan is to lie, to accuse, to enslave, and to oppose the gospel. Those are four of his plans. And in Genesis, we saw this last week, chapter 3, verse 1. This is the first instance of the devil, and it's very telling. In verse 1, the serpent was more crafty than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Indeed, has God said, you shall not eat from any tree of the garden? First words out of his mouth are sketchy. The first words out of his mouth are deceitful and lie-based. The woman said to the serpent, From the fruit of the trees of the garden we may eat, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the middle of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat from it or touch it, or you will what? For the serpent said to the woman, Next phrase from his mouth, You will not surely die. You surely will not die. The second thing he says is a lie. He doesn't even say, um. He just, when he speaks, he lies. And he elaborates in verse 5, For God knows that in the day you eat from it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. And we know how that turned out, and we heard about that last week, that these lies were to pull Adam and Eve from their natural habitat, which was in paradise with God in perfection. So what the devil does, we see here from his opening monologue, is that he's a liar. The devil is a liar. Let me hear you say that. The devil is a liar. In fact, Jesus says in John 8, he says that, talking about the devil, that verse 44, he was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. Whenever he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own nature, for he is a liar and the father of lies. The NIV translates this, that he was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there's no truth in him. There is no truth in the devil. No truth. When he lies, he's speaking his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. Whenever the devil opens up his mouth, a lie comes out. That's his native language. That's what he speaks. You and I speak, speak English or French or Spanish. The devil speaks lie-ish. He's a liar. And whenever he speaks, it's a lie. So, if, if you are hearing lies, if you are believing lies, if around you are swirling whispers of lies and deceit, where is that coming from? The devil. That's coming from the devil. That's coming from the devil. He he works in lies and half-truths. You know, and lies are also withholding truth and exaggerating, right? There would be many times when I would uh, uh, answer questions um, with, without the full information. How much was uh, the meal you just bought? Well, it was $22. Well, it was really $22.99. But I say 22, right? I'm, I'm withholding a little bit of the information so that nobody gets mad at me. The devil is a liar. He's, he deals in half-truths. He deals with exaggerations. He twists things. And so these lies are swirling all around us. Many of us have embraced the devil's narrative for our lives, and we don't even know it. And, and so when we have God's word, which is truth, and we hear the words of Jesus, Jesus is the embodiment of God's truth, right? The word made flesh, he is the way, the truth, and the life. Then we have this, this struggle between a lie and a truth. If you hear the truth, it's coming from God. It's coming from Christ. If you hear a lie, who's this coming from? The devil. The devil. 
deceit and lies and half-truths, deception, they're rooted in Satan. So his plan, number one, is that he wants to lie to you. So we are going to examine our lives this morning and this week. Where are we embracing lies? Where are we believing lies? Because in any of those cases where we're believing lies, we are embracing the devil's plan for our life. When we reject lies, when we reject lies and we say, no, 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 I'm not going to believe that. I know that's what the devil has said. I know that's what my parents told me. I know what, that's what the world has told me. I know what, that's what my friends are pressuring me to believe. That's not true if it's not God's truth and I'm rejecting it. Because lies are of the devil and we don't want to play his game. Amen? Amen. We don't want to play his game. So when lies are swirling around you, And when you lie yourself, you're participating in his work. So I want you to say this morning to lies, get behind me, Satan. Get behind me, Satan. Satan. So the first thing the devil is trying to uh, inform us about this morning, about his failed plan and plot, is that he's a liar. That he's a liar. So we're going to say, get behind me, Satan. Amen? The second thing is that the devil is an accuser. He likes to accuse. We just heard in Genesis that he calls into question what God had said. And he puts Eve in a situation where she has to fuddle and remember what did God say exactly. And he, he's accusing God of holding out on Adam and Eve, right? Isn't that what he does? We can't eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And, and then the devil says, why not? You know, God's holding out on something holding something out on you. Remember Pam told us last week, right? What was God holding out from them? Evil? Oh, shucks, right? They had all good. They had things were very, very good. And so if they eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, all they're gaining is evil, and that's a lousy deal. But the devil is trying to uh, sow doubt in what God has said by accusing God of being a liar and accusing God of being wrong. Let's go to Revelation Chapter 12, that's easy to find if you're new to the Bible. It's the last book, and we'll be in chapter 12. So the devil's plan is to lie, and his plan is also to accuse. And he thinks he's getting off this morning. He thinks he's running away with you bound up on a a pole in some warehouse somewhere, but he doesn't realize that he's told us his whole plan, and we're about to break free and then stop him. Amen? 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 Amen. So, in the beginning, we see that the devil tries to accuse God of being a liar and accuse God of holding out something from his people. In, uh, in Matthew, we'll get to Revelation in a second. Look what he does when he speaks to Jesus. He says, Matthew 4, verse 3, The tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. One of the most inflammatory things that the devil says in his temptation of Jesus is he calls into question his identity as the Son of God. And he's trying to put him in a position where Jesus may potentially question whether or not he is. He's challenging him. He's accusing him. In chapter 4, verse 6, then he said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you. And on their hands they will bear you up so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. You see, the devil tries to accuse God of being a liar. He tries to put pressure on Jesus so that Jesus questions his identity. And you know what? He does it to us too. In Revelation chapter 12, verse 9, this is about his demise. And it says in verse 9, The great dragon was thrown down. The who of old? The serpent. We're talking about the same guy in the garden. The serpent of old, who's called the what? The devil and who? Satan. The dragon, the serpent, the devil, Satan. Same guy. Listen to his job description. Who deceives the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. And then I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now the salvation, the power, and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brethren has been thrown down. He who accuses them before our God day and night. Scripture calls the devil the serpent, the dragon, Satan. And he calls him the accuser 
of the brethren. Now, the purpose of accusation and the purpose of his accusation is to intimidate, to confuse, to attack, and to call into question truth. If you think about this in light of a courtroom, the prosecuting attorney wants to try to accuse the defendant of certain things. And the more intense the questioning, the harder it is for that witness to stand, stand true, stand fast. Where were you on Wednesday night? Where were you on Wednesday night? Oh, were you? Do you have any witnesses that can corroborate your story? Really, where are they? Oh, Peter Taffy? <laughs> you got to do better than that. What do you mean you were at fellowship on Wednesday night? What time were you there? Six. What time did you leave? And where did you go afterwards? Home. Home. <laughs> did you see her when she got home? I did. Oh, looks like you sat with the people that are following your alibi and your story. How convenient. <laughs> How convenient. Where were you on Wednesday? <laughs> fellowship. Fellowship. Sure. Sure. Whose fellowship? Yours. Oh. <laughs> Where were you sitting when you were at fellowship, this so-called fellowship? Middle. I'm talking about when you had dinner. <laughs> Where were you sitting when you had dinner? Like, See? See? <laughs> what did you eat? Oh. Spaghetti and meatballs. That was breakfast. Oh, breakfast. Sure. We always have spaghetti and meatballs at my fellowship. Isn't that right? Yes. Yes, it is. Breakfast. My poor friend is just such an easy target here for this accusation. So you said we have breakfast, but I just have two witnesses that say that we always have spaghetti and meatballs. You know what? I don't want to hear anything else from me. Poor girl, huh? I mean, go ahead. Smack, that's, smack me here for you. So Amy used to come to my fellowship on Wednesdays, right? You see how messed up that is? Amy was at our fellowship on Wednesday, and we had breakfast. And she sat just where she said she did, right? And she was the first one here. She showed up early. My girls were playing in the parking lot and made their life because they're the champions of Amy's fan club, right? But you get some pressure on you, and someone starts asking you questions, you start questioning things, right? That's what an accuser does. That's messed up. Pressure, rapid-fire questions, and, and sows doubt to try to get the person who is sure of their story to question whether or not it really is true. And that's what the devil, that's his full-time job. It says that he does this day and night. He works 24 hours a day trying to get on your case, trying to get in your face, trying to ask you questions, trying to sow doubt in your mind, trying to bring people into your life which will call you to question what you know and have experienced as true. And he's so, so dirty and so rapid fire and so intense and so aggressive that he will get you to shut down. He will get you to be quiet. And if you're not careful, you'll start believing the things that he said. You know, a false accusation can be very damaging. Can you put on the next slide, Tom? A false accusation can be very, very damaging. Does anybody know who this is? This is Richard Jewell. Richard Jewell was a security guard in Atlanta during the 1996 Olympics. And just before uh, there was a bombing down in Centennial Park, Richard Jewell uh, saw that there was a suspicious package in one of the areas, and assuming that it might be something dangerous, he started to clear out uh, the people that were near this suspicious package. He was a contracted security guard, and so he got people away. And sure enough, this package was a bomb filled with shrapnel and nails, and it exploded, and it killed two people, and hundreds, hundreds had died. If it were not for Richard Jewell, who knows how many people would have lost their lives. And so over the next two days, Richard Jewell was held up as a hero until things started to change. Put up the next slide. This is the cover of the Atlanta Journal-Constitution on July 30th, 1996, and it says, FBI suspects the, quote, hero guard may have planted the bomb. Now, if I told you who Richard Jewell was and put up his picture and talked a little bit about the Atlanta bombing, some of you may have thought, well, that's the guy that did it. That's the guy that did it. 
See, the, the authorities and, and the suspicion led uh, the FBI and the local police department to turn this man that was a hero into the main suspect for the bombing. Five years later, they found a man uh, who had actually done it and confessed, right? I forgot what that, guy, that guy's name was. It's all my notes, right? Five years later, they found the guy that actually did it. He confessed to do it, and he is now serving a life sentence. But you know what? The press wasn't as loud and as bold to clear Richard Jewell. And so for the rest of his life, he lived with this false accusation on him so that so many people in the world thought he was the one that did it, even though he didn't. His mother, in fact, died before he was cleared. She died believing, well, not believing that her son did it, but knowing that there was so much false accusation against him. Eventually, the governor of Georgia... Uh, cleared Richard Jewell and publicly invited him to a ceremony where they awarded him one of the highest honors in Atlanta, in, in Georgia. And then a few years later, maybe 1996, so uh, 21 years later, the Atlanta Falcons won the Super Bowl. <laughs> so everything's, everything's fine now. The man that really did it was a man named Eric Rudolph. But you see how false accusations can be powerful? And think about the, this man. I mean, uh, how much grief and anguish he must have dealt uh, with throughout his life. And the man passed away a few years ago, uh, but was at peace about all that happened. You see, the only way that you can resist against someone that's giving you these false accusations is if you know what really happened. And so Richard Jewell never started to believe the false narrative, though he dealt with much shame and anguish from his neighbors and from the country. The way that you can withstand false accusations and an accuser in your face is if you know the story about what really happened and you are convinced that it is true. Look at the next verse here in Revelation. Verse 11, it says that they, the brethren, overcame him because of the blood of the Lamb and because the word of their testimony. And they did not love their life even when faced with death. You see, the way that the people of God overcome this accuser is by holding fast to the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. Where were you on Wednesday night? I was at fellowship. She was at fellowship, she said. And she's holding fast to that word of her testimony this morning. Where were you Wednesday night? She was at fellowship. Did you eat breakfast? Sure did. So the, the accusation of the adversary is, am I love are you really loved by God? Are you really a, a child of God? Right? Are you really who you think you are? Oh, you've sinned. Hmm. You really think you should be praying after you sin, after the day you had yesterday? You really think you should show your face with other people at church? Now, if you have been washed in the blood of the Lamb, and you're holding fast to the word of your testimony, you say, yes, yes, I am. Get behind me, Satan. I am a child of God. I have been washed by the blood of the Lamb. Yes, I've done many things wrong, but I know my God is faithful and just to forgive me when I come to Him and repent and confess those things. There hasn't been a day when I haven't turned back to my God that He hasn't welcomed me and received me. His Son died on my behalf, has given me the chance for new life. I've been born again. I've been filled with God's Spirit. What do you have to say? Get behind me saying, you might be an accuser, but I've got the word of my testimony, that I'm not who I used to be. Do I got a long way to go? Absolutely. But you know what? You can't say anything that's going to get me off track. That's what the devil wants to try to do. He wants to sow discord in your heart and in your life about what God really thinks and says about you. He's going to get in your face. Did you really? Did that really happen? Are you really that person? Really? Do you think everybody else really thinks that? All these, these questions, these rapid fire uh, prosecuting attorney of questions, you got to say, get behind me, Satan. Judge, can you do something about this? Out of order, prosecutor, get out of here. 
And then your defense attorney, Jesus, can take the stand and remind you about where you were and what you said and all the rest. You see, the devil is trying to accuse us. So when you start feeling these accusations, when you start hearing these accusa accusations in your heart and in your head, who are they from? The devil. They're from the devil. This is what he's trying to do to you. This is what he's trying to say to you. So when you start hearing these things and feeling these things, you have to say, get behind me, Satan. Get behind me, Satan. You don't have right to my life and to my heart and to my head. Get behind me. Satan, if he lies to you, you say, get behind me, Satan. If he starts to accuse you, what are you going to say? Get behind me, Satan. Amen. 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 The next thing that the devil is going to try to do is he's going to try to enslave. He's going to try to keep people in bondage. And let's look at Luke for some evidence of this. Luke chapter 13. Luke chapter 13. The devil... His plot and his plan is to lie and to accuse and to enslave. And we're going to say, get behind me, Satan, when these things start to creep up. We're staying in our natural habitat. You're not bringing us out. You're not causing us to trip up. In Luke chapter 13, look at what the devil has planned. In verse 10, this is speaking of Christ. And uh, he, Jesus, was teaching in one of the synagogues. On the Sabbath. And there was a woman who for 18 years had a sickness caused by a what? A spirit. That's an unclean spirit. A demon. Now not all sickness is caused by unclean spirits. But we see here that there are some that are caused by demons and unclean spirits. And she was bent double and could not straighten up at all. And when Jesus saw her, he called her over and said to her, Woman... You are freed from your sickness. See how Jesus just dealt with it so directly. And then he laid his hands on her and immediately she was made erect again and began doing what? Glorifying God. But the synagogue official, indignant because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath, began saying to the crowd in response, There are six days in which work should be done, so come during them and get healed and not on the Sabbath day. Oh boy. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine that? That's another sermon. Wow. <laughs> Verse 15. But the Lord answered and said to him, You hypocrites, does not each of you on the Sabbath untie his ox or his donkey from the stall and lead him away to water him? This woman, a daughter of Abraham, as she is, whom Satan has done what? Bound for 18 long years. Should she not have been released from this bond on the Sabbath day, and as he said, as all his opponents were being humiliated, and the entire crowd was rejoicing over the glorious things being done by him. That's amazing. What we see here from this record is that one of the devil's plots and plans is to enslave and bind people, to have them be uh, in chains. Sometimes it's physical, sometimes it's spiritual. In this case, this woman was sick and, and, and hurting for 18 years because of a demonic influence in her life. Jesus came, dealt with this directly, and she was not only healed, but she was made free. And Jesus said that the healing of this woman was releasing her from Satan's bond on her life. So one of the things that Satan wants to do is he wants to try to enslave and hold people in bondage. Sometimes the bondage that he puts people in is bondage physically, physical sickness, which is from the devil in these cases, and they are bound because of it. Sometimes they're in other kinds of bondage, bondage to sin, emotional bondage, relational bondage, bondage to fear, and things like that. Oftentimes when someone is under the influence of a demon, the word that's used for them is that they are possessed. Well, let's, let's look at that word for a second. The word possessed, this is from Merriam-Webster, it says to have and to hold as property, to own, to seize and take control of, like take into one's possession, to enter into and control firmly or to dominate, to bring or cause to fall under the influence, domination, or control of some emotional or intellectual response or reaction. Now, 
don't misunderstand. There are literal instances of demonic possession. And the way that those need to be dealt with is through the authority and the name of Jesus Christ. That can't be something you try to face on your own. You need the Lord's help. He had authority over all of them, and he's the one that handles it. But there are also instances where we might be under the possession of the evil one because he's got a hold on us. He's got a hold on our hearts. He's got a hold on our emotions. He's got a hold on our lives. The devil can have possession of a person because something other than Christ has a hold over them. If we are held captive or possessed by fear, or if we are held captive or bound by our emotion, if we are bound or enslaved or held captive by ungodly desires, we're being possessed by the one who wants to bind us and enslave us. This is what he wants to do to you. And so when Jesus faced off against the devil, oftentimes he would do something that our English Bibles uh, translate cast. Right? What are you supposed to do when you see a demon? You cast it out. In whose name? Jesus. Well, the word cast means to cause to move or send forth by throwing. Like casting a fishing lure. To throw off or away to get rid of. And so these things where the devil wants to uh, have you bound or enslaved to his, uh, to his devices, to his work, we have to cast them away in Jesus' name. And that doesn't mean we just put it aside, right? I'm going to cast off this tambourine. I'm just going to put it over here. No, 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 no. You need to throw this tambourine far away, right? When you go fishing, Pam, please corroborate this. Because I have no idea. When you go fishing, you cast that line out far. You don't just drop it in next to the boat. If you just drop it in next to the boat, those fish are like, well, there's a boat. So <laughs> probably not going to go after that. But you throw that baby out, it looks just like the other things floating in the ocean. And those sharks come and grab it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Amen. It works for the sermon illustration, right? <laughs> but these things that the devil wants to enslave you in, we have to cast them far away in Jesus' name. We can't, we can't um, become comfortable with these things that the devil wants to enslave you to. And keep it nearby or just shake it off or have it go into the other room. It's got to go. It's got to get out of the house. In 1 Corinthians, it tells us that we're supposed to flee idolatry, which means run away from it, get away from it. If you are being held captive by, by Satan, by this dragon, by this liar, by this accuser, the ones that wants to uh, keep you in bondage, if it's bondage in some spiritual sickness, if it's some bondage uh, to a sin pattern, if it's bondage to your emotions where every time something happens, you just can't handle life anymore, we got to cast these things away in Jesus' name. We also first have to recognize that these things, if they are determining how we live and how we act, they're not from God. Whom the Son sets free is free indeed. The devil wants to keep you in bondage. So if there are areas of your life where these other things, these spiritual things, these uh, physical things, these demonic things are in control of you, that's not God's will and desire for your life, and you can have freedom through Jesus Christ. But you can't make peace with it. This woman that was bent over didn't want to be like that anymore. She wanted to be free. She recognized this thing that held her captive for 18 years of her life was not good. And she was searching and seeking for that one who would have the power to cast it away. And she found it in Jesus. And that's whom it's found in. So recognize that if there's bondage in your life, who's bringing that? Satan. Satan. And I want you to say to it, get behind me, Satan. 
If you're believing lies, if, if you're being lied to, if you're being tempted by lies, that's the devil's work. Get behind me, Satan. If you're being accused, if he's in your face, if people are in your face trying to get you to doubt God's love for you, to doubt God's purpose for your life, that's not from God. That's from the devil. And you need to say, get behind me, Satan. And if you are in bondage, physical bondage, spiritual bondage, relationship bondage, emotional bondage, that's not God's desire for your life either. And so we'll say to that too, get behind me, Satan. Amen? And the last thing that the devil has plots for, that he's revealing himself today, and we're about ready to bust out of here and go get him, like Batman and Robin always did, is that the devil opposes the gospel. The devil opposes the gospel. And we'll look at Acts chapter 4. The devil is a liar. His plan is to lie. His plan is to accuse. His plan is to enslave. And his plan is to oppose the gospel. And I'm ready to say this morning, get behind me, Satan. I'm not letting these things become normal in my life. I'm not letting these things have rule in my life. I'm not letting these things have influence in my life. I'm going to let the Lord determine my life and not you. Amen? So the devil is opposed to the gospel. We'll get to Acts 4 in a second. When Jesus uh, taught the parable of the sower, he taught about different ways that people respond to the gospel. And the first way that people respond is like a man who throws seeds out on a road. And birds come and eat it. And when he gave the interpretation, he said this. He said, when anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the reason why is because look who shows up. The evil one. The evil one comes and snatches away what has been sown in his heart. This is the one whom seed was sown besides the road. So when someone hears the gospel, the devil is looking for somebody to snatch that from. Maybe the reason why the person at your job that you've been praying for and trying to speak the word to and loving and showing kindness, maybe the reason they haven't believed yet isn't because you haven't done a good job. Maybe it's because the devil is messing with them. Because the devil is opposed to the gospel. In Mark, Jesus said that these are the ones who are beside the road where the word is sown. And when they hear, immediately who? Satan comes and takes away the word which has been sown in them. And then look at what Luke says. Luke says that those beside the road are those who have heard, and then the devil comes and takes away the word from their heart so that they will not what? Believe and be saved. I need you to tell your neighbor, that's messed up. It is. That's messed up. The devil's objective is to get in before that gospel can get rooted and bring salvation to that person. The devil comes and tries to snatch it away because if that gospel stays and they believe it, they're going to be saved. So his objective is to oppose the gospel by snatching it away from people, by stopping the opportunities from them hearing it, by putting obstacles in their way when they're on their way to come and seek the Lord. This is the devil's doing. This is the devil's doing. In 2 Corinthians, Paul said that if our gospel is veiled, covered, it's veiled to those who are perishing. And in their case, the God of this world, that's the devil, has blinded the minds of the unbelieving so that they might not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. Someone that doesn't believe the gospel is on the wrong path, on the way towards perishing. And the devil, because he hates it so much, is blinding their eyes. It's like someone walking towards a cliff and someone comes before they get to the cliff and says, hey, I want you to put on this blindfold. If someone you knew and someone you loved was walking towards a cliff and then somebody else came and put a blindfold on them, how would that make you feel? That's what the devil is doing. He's in opposition to the gospel and he's trying to keep people in the dark. He's trying to keep people in the dark. Look what the devil's agents did to the apostles in Acts chapter 4, verse 13. 
When they observed the confidence of Peter and John, they understood they were uneducated and untrained men. And they were amazed and they began to recognize them as having been with Jesus. And seeing a man that had been healed standing with them, they had nothing to say in reply. But when they had ordered them to leave the council, they began to confer with one another, saying, What shall we do with these men? For the fact that a noteworthy miracle has taken place through them is apparent to all who live in Jerusalem, and we can't deny it. But so that it will not spread any further among the people, let us warn them to speak no longer to any man in this name. And when they had summoned them, they commanded them not to do what? To speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. They couldn't deny the miracle. They couldn't deny the testimony. But they just didn't want it to spread any further. They lost one guy. They didn't want to lose any more. That's the devil's objective. He is, oppos he is in opposition to the gospel. So if you feel opposition to the gospel, if you see or hear things or people or our society in opposition to the gospel, who is that from? The devil. And what are we going to say to him? Get behind me, Satan. Here's some evidence of the devil's influence. Internal pressure, pressure not to speak the gospel. Crippling fear about sharing your faith. Societal changes which make it harder to talk about Christ. A lack of concern for those enslaved to the devil. Other people discouraging or quenching your passion to reach the lost. Inward religious, even Christian activity, without an outward focus. If we just sat here every week, worship God, and, 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 and ministered to each other, and, and saw miracles amongst this group, I imagine the devil would be willing to just leave it at that, as long as you don't tell anybody else. As long as we don't tell anybody else. As long as the, the word doesn't get out. Because he is in opposition to the gospel. Because he knows that it's in the gospel of Jesus Christ that men can find freedom and truth and deliverance and life forever. Amen? Amen. Amen. So this morning we're going to say, get behind me, Satan. If you start seeing lies and hearing lies or are believing lies in your life, who's that from? The devil. The devil. And what are you going to say to him this morning? Get behind me, Satan. If you are feeling accused and... The devil is speaking accusations against you and calling into question your faith or putting people that are accusing you and these rapid-fire questions of pressure. Who's that from? The devil. the devil. And what are you going to say to him? Get behind me, Satan. If there is bondage in your life, if we are enslaved to things in our life, things not of God, that's from the devil. And what are we going to say to him? We're going to say, get behind me, Satan. And if we're feeling pressure to stay quiet about the things of God, that's certainly not of God either. Who's that from? That's from the devil. And we're going to say, get behind me, Satan. So I want you this morning, for these four things, and there are more, but these four things I want you to recognize in your life. When you start seeing these things or hearing these things or feeling these things, that's from the devil. This is what he wants. This is his plot and his plan. And rather than them overtaking you, I want you to be like Batman and Robin, who are just sitting there tied up thinking, man, this man is dumb. He is telling us his plan, and we are about to bust free out of here and not only defeat him, but also win this battle for everyone else, too. So let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the example of Jesus that helps us to pinpoint and identify what's of you and what's of him. And this morning, I say, we say, get, up, get away, Satan. Get away, devil. We're not going to fall for your lies, for your accusations, for your enslavement, and for your opposition to the gospel anymore. So give us eyes to see, Lord, and ears to hear, so that we may stand for you free and be on the mission to free others. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.